I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! This is Snowman in the Morning, and it begins now. What? On your mark, get set, and go. Good morning! Ah, damn, that felt good. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Snowman in the Morning, coming to you live from Terre Haute, Indiana. I'll be here all week. Got a couple of uh, Sycamore games to cover, a few other pieces to put in place. Snowman of the Morning, coming to you live on arenasportsnet.com, as well as iHeartRadio, TuneIn, as well as Spreaker.com, and a few other places where you can find us. Can't get us live? Want to get the replay? Search Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other platforms. The string you need is Snowman in the Morning. Follow us on all of our social media. The ID you need for Facebook and Twitter is at SIT Morning. And for Instagram, follow our new Instagram, the full string snowman in the morning. The number to call, 888-491-5342. 888-491-5342. And that's how we get started here. I'll review the poor pick that Robert and I did yesterday. Got another hit. And we're going to have a few more. Um, got uh, Mike DeBay coming on at 8.35. I'll talk some NBA basketball today and tomorrow, as well as some college basketball. It's getting close to March Madness. And our show is powered by Pro Picks. If you want to place your bet on uh, some good advice, follow them at Pro Picks Now. The website you need is ProPicksNow.com. That's ProPicksNow.com. Dot com. You can hear Robert Prevera every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during the show. As mentioned, got Mike DeBate coming on at 8.35 to talk one fatal flaw and some other things. And I'll get to some NBA stuff in just a moment. But I want to start here. I had fun talking about the Colin Kaepernick situation. And I got some uh, I got some feedback from some people that think, what do you mean no one won? Well, no one did win. No one did win that case. But I'm not going to talk about him being available, meaning Kaepernick. What I'm going to talk about, you know what? Change my mind. Change my mind. All the football content will be with Mike during the second sec during the uh, second segment. Let me do what I had planned to do, and that's talk about a little hatred. What do you mean, Snowman? What I mean is this. After reading some comments that I read on Facebook and via social media, as Robin explained so very well last week when I had her on, and I'm going to have her on tomorrow, the hate, she said the hatred is real for Tom Brady, and it is. The hatred's also real for Kevin Durant. Why? He made a grown man decision to leave a team that wasn't going to get him any championships and join a team that did. They want to call Kevin Durant a snake. They want to call him uh, a traitor. They want to say, oh, you could have established your legacy in OKC. Wrong answer. Russell Westbrook took care of that. And yes, while Paul George is busy balling out right now in OKC because Westbrook finally decided, hey, if I'm going to get somewhere in the playoffs, I can't be the dominant one and I got to take a back seat. You're too late, Westbrook. The best teammate you ever had that could help you get over the hump when y'all had the chance in 2012 got the hell out of Dodge and said, the hell with you. I'll go somewhere else where people actually appreciate what I do. And Golden State appreciates what he does, which is why I'm here to tell you I don't believe Kevin Durant is leaving. 
I don't think he's leaving. Why do you think he went the hell off on the media the other night? He's there to play basketball, period. He's there to play basketball, end of story. Because what people don't realize is that the Golden State Warriors save an incident early in the season where have are having fun again. They're doing what there's they doing they are doing what they love to do. And quite frankly, they don't care what people think. They really don't. They don't care what people think. They don't care what people do. Period. I mean, what the hell are you going to do? They have Kevin Durant. They've uh, reports have listed Kevin Durant going to the Knicks. uh, Reports have listed Kevin Durant going to um, the Lakers. God forbid. God forbid he goes to the Lakers. That would be, that would create an even more messed up situation. Or he goes to Boston, which he's not. I'm telling y'all right now, Kevin Durant isn't going anywhere. And the hatred is just going to continue to pile up on him because for the first time in his career, he's with a team that he loves. He's with a team and teammates that he loves to be around. He's playing basketball at a very high level. He snatched the throne from LeBron as if LeBron had it in the first place, and he didn't. Kevin Durant is being himself and having fun. And his current teammates encourage that. If he went anywhere else, anywhere else, I guarantee you, he would be in a pit of despair that he was in Oklahoma City. Now the arguments are, are, uh, I can't talk this morning. The arguments are going to come out that, hey, he should establish his own legacy with his own team. Um, he is because he established a new legacy with a better team. He established a new legacy with a better team. And that better team is the team that, yes, defeated Oklahoma City in 2016 in the Western Conference Finals. And frankly, Oklahoma City will never see the Western Conference Finals again as long as Russell Westbrook is playing. It's the same team that, yes, gave up a three games to one lead in the NBA Finals in 2016 and what many call the greatest comeback in NBA Finals history. I call the greatest farce in NBA Finals history. Thank you, Adam Silver, and the stimulus package you gave to the Cleveland Cadavers for that. Were it not for Draymond Green getting suspended before Game 5, of the 2016 finals, we'd be talking about a four-peat. Five if you count this year, because I don't think anybody's going to touch the Golden State Warriors. And yet the hatred since he made the decision to leave Oklahoma City is still being heaped on Kevin Durant, and my question is why? If you can't have any hatred for Tom Brady because he keeps winning, if you couldn't have any hatred for Joe Montana, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson because they kept winning, if you can't have any hatred for Stephen Curry and the Warriors, and believe me, they're going to get more hatred than ever because it seems they have found their groove. It seems they have found their groove. And you know what pisses people off? Is that the Warriors did find their groove. And Kevin Durant's a part of it. He himself said after the moment happened against the Clippers, KD forgave Draymond Green. That moment afterwards, you see how they're playing now? You see how Kevin Durant's playing now? I mean, granted, they took a slap in the face against the Portland Trailblazers, but you know what's going to happen when those two teams meet in Oakland. Portland has a 2-0 lead in this regular season series. Regular season. They beat them once in Oakland when when the Warriors were injured, and they beat them in Portland before the All-Star break. 
They did that three years ago, and, and the Warriors slapped them around. And beat them in a five-game series when Stephen Curry didn't appear for the first two games. Draymond Green is the engine that drives the Warriors. Kevin Durant is one of the faces of the Golden State Warriors in their final season at Oracle Arena. And not only that, he's going to be the face of the Warriors when they blow open the doors to the Chase Center in San Francisco. When they blow the doors off the Chase Center in San Francisco, Kevin Durant's going to be there. Stephen Curry's going to be there. Clay Thompson's going to be there. DeMarcus Cousins will be there. Could I be totally wrong on this assessment? Certainly. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. And I will come on here and pick up this microphone and say as much. But I don't care what y'all think. Well, I do because it, it, it allows me to have fun, you know, talking to others. Allows me to have fun and a great debate. But if Kevin Durant was smart, like I deem him to be, he ain't going anywhere. What are your thoughts, folks? 888-591-5342. Excuse me, 888-491-5342. And I think I have Cole Johnson on the line with me. What's up, CJ? Hey, what's up? What's up? I got a question. Why... And I, this is how I started the show. Why is there so much hatred for Kevin Durant? <laughs> oh, uh, hmm. I think there is more, only one answer to that. And that answer is? Well, loyalty. And, and the reason why <laughs> I, I say that you know, we all want to have our uh, ball players yep. play on one team. And yep. if they play on one team and they amass whatever success they do with one team, then they're successful. But if they do so with other teams, and this also goes for LeBron too, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you get a lot of hatred thrown on you. <laughs> now you add on to it with Durant, he goes from – a pretty good team to the best team in, in the at the moment <laughs> who already won a chip before he got there. Yes. And then you have what you have received the last three years. And, you know, people think that the guy has had, had two championships handed to him because the squad around him is elite. Which it is. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> Here is where it's all messed up, though. Mm -hmm. you, you get on demand for him switching from one team to another. Yep. And switching from one team to a better one. Mm hmm. But you create, but as, as fans, you create the atmosphere of, quote, as a player, your career is better if you get a ring. Close quote. For example, <laughs> you got oh man, well, Anthony who chased after the money could have gotten a ring. Mm -hmm. So he has the money, but what's the general consensus about Carmelo Anthony's career? No rings. He's not a champion. No rings. So he's going to get devalued in any argument because of that alone. Mm -hmm. Durant, no matter how. You may feel about him. He has two championships right now. Yeah, we're more likely third. three as we... Yeah, more likely three <laughs> after mid-June. <laughs> so, yeah, you could talk. Well, he, he's a snake and he's a traitor because he went from his original team and he signed on his own, uh, uh, on his own volition with the Warriors. That's the point. But he it doesn't matter. made his own decision. Matter. Right. But it doesn't matter. He, he has rings. He's rings. a champion. What else? Can, what can you say? You can't say jack to that. Mm -hmm. 
but that but in a nutshell, that's what people say. I can't stand Durant. That's a traitor. He's a snake, and all that type, all the other type of uh, junk. But the, but he's his own man. He's his own. He's his own man. And I don't care who you are. And I will put it this way: always, if you have a choice to better your life, what would you do? You would say, "Oh no, no, no." Doing something mean or doing something that's not all that great, or being in a situation that's not all that great is much better than being in a situation that is much better and I had the chance to make it better. Mm-hmm. Get out of here! You, you lose me with that. And, and the problem with all the re- the supposed reports that are coming out: oh, he's going, he's going to the Knicks, he's going to the Lakers, and I think of all these. The Boston Celtics were even mentioned, and. My thinking is, why the hell would he leave the ultimate situation? The same goes for Clay Thompson. They're not moving. They're having too much fun. And they're the type of players that this is the type of fun they want to have. I mean, they, they get to play in a wide open offense, uh, a team where the coach respects them. And not just and not just for the people they are, but for the games they have. Yeah, why would okay? <laughs> why why would Durant want to go from a guy who has proven championship success now as a coach, much less as a player, mm-hmm. to go to a place where, okay, Fisdale's respected, but his championship pedigree nowhere near the same as Curry's. Nowhere near. Why would Durant want to go there? Why would Clay and same thing with Thompson? Why would he want to go from go from the situation where he is now to the dumpster fire that is in Southern California, only four hundred thirty miles south of there? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. Why would Why would Clay Thompson want to go to that uh, dumpster fire when his own father, who is very active in his life, and yet that's a direct shot at a comment I got off the air yesterday. When his father, who's very involved in his life, told the press he's not leaving Oakland, I'm inclined to believe the word of a parent than believe the word of these people that love putting quote-unquote reports out there saying, oh, he's going to go here, he's going to go there. No, he's not. Yeah, and on top of it, this, this same father not only has played in the sport, just like Clay did, he played on the Lakers. Yep. So he knows the culture, knows the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So if, if 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 Michael Thompson would do anything, he would probably say to his son Clay, "All right, now it may be different because it was thirty years prior to now, but mm-hmm. I, you know, hey, I played on a team with Magic, so I could tell you how Magic runs a team." Right, it was cool because I got it. I got some rings with him. Yeah, that's awesome. So you may get love, but here's the other side too. That's the thing parents do to their children. They try to hip them to game so they could be informed and get and have the best decision possible for them exactly. to move forward. So <laughs> if if Michael were to say to 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 Clay, oh yeah. I think you, your career would be best served to go down south. Guaranteed, Clay would be going down south. But I know Michael sees what Clay's doing. I said, okay, oh, you, yeah. son, you got three championships. You got a great situation where you are now. You build a dynasty up there, just like I help build the dynasty down in, in L.A. You know what? Be your own man and build your own stuff. Because that's how I was when I came up in the game. Yep. You're doing that now. You're coming up in the game. That makes me happier than you putting on the uniform that I used to put on. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, it's that, it's that simple, that basic. Because yeah, I'm sure Michael's telling Clay, no, nah, man, stay where you are because you're building yeah. something oh, yeah. unique to you. And you're building something unique to the league, period. Yeah. And, and that's the entire identity of this entire team in Oakland. It's their own identity. And the best part is they're establishing it at a time when no one expected them to, number one. And number two, they're doing this organically. Contrary to some articles I know you've read and I've read, 
that say they haven't built this team organically. Want to bet? And that goes back to the rest. <laughs> and now cousin. You know, because people think, okay, well, this is the this is the best team money has, has bought. You know, the Warriors have bought themselves uh, all-stars. Mm, let me see. Uh, <laughs> Draymond Green, drafted. Yep. Uh, Clay Thompson, drafted. drafted. Uh, the Strokes, it's a drink. Stephon Curry, drafted. drafted. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't go on free agency and sought them out. You know? Cool. And, cool. And, then, cool. and then you add the other two pieces here with Durant and Cousins. They really didn't seek those two out either. They chose the Warriors. So and, <laughs> what can you say? And that's where people get it wrong saying, oh, um, uh, the Warriors went after Durant and went after Cousins. Wrong answer. Durant and Cousins came to them, called them, and said, can we play for you guys and have some fun? That's where people that get this wrong all the time. And and that is allowed. I mean, this is, even though this is a grown man's game, uh, I believe fun is allowed. I mean, if you, yeah. I, as I said, if you get the opportunity to be the best you can be in a situation where you can have the least amount of drama and, a, and the least <laughs> amount of trouble. Yes. Wouldn't you be smart to take that, take up on that offer and want to be in a place where and, you can and do run what you it. do? And run yeah. with it. Yeah, to do what you do and you have all of the freedom to do it. I mean, yeah, you would run with it. I don't care who you are. You'd run with that opportunity. And I've said before yeah. many, many times over about the supposed landing spots for Kevin Durant and DeMarcus Cousins. How about their current spot where they are now? Who says that the Warriors, given the fact that they have a new arena coming across the bay in San Francisco... They're getting all the benefits of the championships that they have now, that they've garnered now, three and four years. Who's to say that they won't find a way to open their checkbook, call both Durant and Boogie in the office and say, name your price? Clay Thompson also, for that matter, but you got to figure Clay would get the first mini because he was drafted by Golden State. Yeah, Kevin Durant and DeMarcus Cousins are big parts of the picture. But you got to take care of Clay Thompson first, which they will. You take care of Clay one day, and then the next day, call the whole team in the office. You bring Kevin Durant and Demarcus Cousins, open the checkbook, and say, "Write your figure." I see nothing uh, wrong with that. Uh, is this a prediction or a spoiler? Because I think that's exactly what's going to happen. It. <laughs> I think it's a spoiler. More than anything else, I think it's – listen, many reports have come out saying the Warriors won't be able to afford DeMarcus Cousins. My two words are, want to bet? And you can, you can rewind the tape. <laughs> <laughs> I have said this to you already. <laughs> uh, Cousins is as good as a Warrior. Yep. Same with Durant. Same with Clay Thompson. The reason why – they will pay them. They want me. May not slide the max at all three, but they're going to slide a whole chunk of money all those all those players. Yep. Because as good as play as good as a player as Draymond Green is, I think his time in Oakland slash San Francisco slash Bay Area is over. Yes. And and I think he's going he's going to go somewhere else because he, his heir apparent is already there, mm -hmm. already playing some big time minutes. Yep. And. That big contract to be will be gone, and that will open the door to re-sign Clay, re-sign Durant, and Durant's probably not going to sign a four-year deal. He's probably going to sign maybe a two, maybe even a three-year deal. Yeah, and that's going to re-sign Cousins. And Cousins, as I said to you before, that dude is as happy as I think I've ever seen him. I've never seen Demarcus Cousins this there. happy playing basketball in such a freestyle offense. I've never seen him this happy. I've never seen Kevin Durant this happy. And as I said at the top of the program, 
You can say whatever you want about Durant being a snake. He made a decision to leave Russell Westbrook behind and his ball hogging, controlling ways and say, you know what? I'm going to play with a point guard that actually distributes the basketball. Now, yeah, Westbrook has taken a backseat to Paul George, but this is this is February. You know what's going to happen when April gets here. Do we need to discuss that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, <laughs> look, I, 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 I have a lot of respect for Westbrook. And it is funny, though, that it took Durant to leave for Westbrook to channel all of a sudden Austin Robertson and yeah. just be the walking triple-double. Yep. You know, and, and I have said this, too. Uh, the best year that Westbrook has had, even though he still cannot hit the side of a barn at times when he shoots, <laughs> is this year. Because he has understood, okay, yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of game, and it's wonderful, but in order for the team to advance, or at least in order for the team to have the best chance to advance, I can I have to dial back my offense just a little bit. I mean, it, it, it's funny. It took two and a half years in seeing the best player that that franchise has had since the Sean Kemp and Gary Payton days. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's no coincidence to me that it, it took seeing that type of teammate leave for Westbrook to make an under, to, to make an impact the way he should. But uh, there was a reason why Durant left. And part of that reason was number zero. And, and, and we can we can gloss over that all we want. The fact of the matter is, Durant wanted to be happy. He wasn't happy in that situation. And that's it. I mean, what else is there to say on that one? I mean, <laughs> not a okay, thing. he was not a great fit for Durant uh, emotionally because he just didn't feel as though he could block into the basketball player that he is now. Yep. And now he's in his prime. He's winning chips. It seems like now he's <laughs> winning other awards too now. I mean, he's getting and he's getting the recognition I think he's always wanted to have anyway. Mm-hmm. And he's getting that recognition on a team with talent that's the, that's the, as prodigious as he is. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Westbrook is, is looking at that and he's saying, dang, that probably didn't mean me. Durant, well, in his 12th, Durant in his 12th season is having the most fun I've ever seen him have play basketball. Same with DeMarcus Cousins in his 8th year. You wouldn't believe that Durant's in his 12th year, Steph's in his 10th, and Clay is in his 8th, Draymond in his 7th, Cousins in his 8th. You wouldn't believe they've been in the league this long because time has flown by as this team has been built. I echo the words of a radio host who said, the Warriors haven't been rebuilding. They've been building. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, p- people think, uh, I think when, when this particular crop got onto the radar of the national scene, which would be 2013, you know, people thought, okay, well, they're, these are young pups. They're, they're, they're getting their sea legs under them. Okay. Yep. You know, they, they seem to have some game uh, and they have potential. And, you know, they said that about that team in 2013. They said the same thing about the team in 2014. They had yep. a hard fought seven game series against the, the, the Clippers. Against the Clippers. Of course they, yeah, of course they got, they, they bowed out last minute in game seven. Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of people are saying, okay, well, you know, this team has real good potential. They won 50 games that year. Okay, I think I think we're going to see some really good things from them. What took everybody by surprise was the elevation was not so long. Right. From playoff contender to champion. Mm-hmm. Because they took the hugest step that I think I've ever seen a team take in quite some time from being a contender to being the best team in the league. Yes. And the pieces were already there. I mean, and, 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 and it rewind that clock back. I mean, like like you said, 
you know, Steph would be what for five years in the league then. Yeah, Clay four, Draymond three. So I mean, they 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 had a feel for how the game was the NBA, and they had a feel for each other as a team. All they needed was just a couple of uh, a couple of, of 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 strategic changes here, a couple of tweaks there, and off they go. Yep. And and they have been the best team the last four years. And the biggest tweak that was made, and the biggest tweak that was made involves one of my favorite players from uh, near my hometown. I believe his name is Andre Iguodala. Best six man in a long. Yes. No question about that. No question about that. Because what he has been able to do is defensively. He has made them. You, you can probably put his lone exception of Curry. You can almost put any of the pieces on the court against any of the five players on it on the right. opposite end. Absolutely, and defend them. And he frees up the other four to do what they do defensively. Now uh, <laughs> that is huge. When you on defense in the NBA can be able to do what you you do best. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I mean, because you know, Curry is not a one-on-one defender, but he is a great help defender. Yes, he is. If you if, if you if you doubt me, check out the steals he gets. Yep. Uh, you know, Green very versatile on defense. Mm-hmm. He can block shots. He can do steals. He can lock it down. It just depends on what you need from him. And as Clay a, Thompson's probably the best one-on-one defender you've got on the squad. And then yep. Iguodala, he, he basically is like a 6'6 version of Akeem Olajuwon. Whatever mistake you have, he'll clean it up for you. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> that's what you need. That's what you need on defense. That, that is what you need. need on defense. That's exactly what you need. Cole Johnson joining me here on this lightning round edition of Snowman in the Morning, talking the hatred of Kevin Durant and the hatred of the Warriors and why y'all should quit it. If we have to respect the Patriots, you have to respect the Warriors the same way, especially when Kevin Durant made his decision. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Appreciate the time. Cole Johnson, courtesy of Cole Sports, joining me this morning. I have Mike DeBate coming on in less than 120 seconds from now. Snowman in the morning presented by ProPix. Visit them online at ProPixNow.com. You can hear Robert Prevera and company every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday give the best pick of the day. We nailed one yesterday when Illinois and Wisconsin, Wisconsin was getting 11 points at the Kohl Center And Illinois, even though they lost, they lost by only six. So that pro pick came through. 64-58 was the final score of that game. We'll have another good one tomorrow. And stay with us all throughout March Madness because it's going to be silly. It's absolutely going to be silly. We're going to have all kinds of breakdowns for you throughout the course of March, throughout the course of the NCAA tournament. As we get you ready for the NCAA tournament, we're going to cover it from start to finish, from the tip-off in Dayton to the finish in Minneapolis. Let's talk some football now, shall we? On the uh, wireless hot, Verizon Wireless Hotline with me is a fellow you've heard all season long. We're going to talk some off-season stuff. His name is Mike DeBate, and he joins me right now. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Brian. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing good, man. You you all right from that snowstorm y'all got? <laughs> you know, it's always much ado about nothing when it comes to snowstorms up here in New England. I think we <laughs> thought we were going to get a lot more than we did, and we ended up, you know, just uh, it's, it's always always fun, always always a pleasure. But uh, you know, we uh, we got through it, so we look to fight another one. My good. Friend. Well, the last time I was here in Terre Haute, we got a warning that closed uh, the campus here at Indiana State for a couple of days but it wasn't the snow it was just plain cold oh yeah bitter <laughs> bitter cold i remember oh, i remember those I, I do remember those those forecasts and those uh those pieces of information uh yeah. unbelievable <laughs> we're crazy absolutely crazy all right let's talk some football and i want to start here by asking the question 
where does Joe Flacco land? What's the best fit for Joe Flacco? Wait, what happened? Did I lose you? I'm sorry. Can you oh. hear me? I think we had oh. a little. I think, there you go. <laughs> sorry about that. I think, we, I think we had a little difficulty. My apologies on that. All right. Oh, that was on my end, not yours. Um, <laughs> we'll try. We'll try it again, and I'll pose the question: <laughs> Where? What's the best fit for Joe Flacco? Well, it's it's tough to say. I mean, it looks like, by all accounts, it looks like. Denver is going to be the place. And, you know, I don't necessarily think that's a bad fit for him. I think it, it allows him to go in, uh, have a couple of, you know, decent, uh, you know, receivers between Sanders, if, you know, if, you know, assuming that he's going to be back in, uh, in Denver. Um, you know, it's a chance for a new beginning for Joe Flacco. Look, there's still some gas left in the tank with him. I know a lot of people want to write him off and say that he's completely done and there's nothing that's going to be able to uh, to come of that. I don't necessarily think that's the case. You know, I think he definitely um, got to the end of the line in, in Baltimore, and I think Baltimore unquestionably made the right decision by going with Lamar Jackson. It's his time, it's his team, and the way they're building that team is definitely more in his image than anything else. But, you know, Flacco's going to be an interesting fit in Denver. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, I don't know. I've heard a lot of people that every time a quarterback becomes available, all of a sudden Jacksonville becomes the place where he should be, simply because I think the talent around that team and so many people believe that the reason that they didn't contend this year and that they weren't as good is because the team's finally caught on to Blake Bortles. Um, yeah. you know, I'm not sure exactly how that's that's going to work, um, you know, with the Jacksonville uh, situation, but I think I guess the best way I can put it with Flacco is I think Denver's as good a, uh, as good a fit as any, and you know we'll see we'll see what happens uh, throughout the year. Speaking of quarterbacks, and you just touched on Jacksonville, how do they move on from Blake Bortles? Well, I mean, in terms of being able to move on from him, I think that there's definitely there's a, unquestionably a whole lot of sentiment that they they definitely would like to do that from the fans' perspective. Um, I think that they definitely want to see somebody new in there. Now, Eli Manning's name comes up constantly. Uh, you hear about possibly Ryan Tannehill. Um, you know, if he's cut loose by Miami and things, just, you know, kind of progress in that direction, will they go in that direction and bring someone like that in? You know, it's it's tough to say that the Jacksonville Jaguars are definitely going to cut loose portals, but I think you saw a lot of the the wheels definitely came off the machine in Jacksonville last year. Yeah, that's a team that was a very very common and I think very um, uh, universally sound preseason pick for a lot of teams that were thinking that that was going to be an AFC championship game between the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New England Patriots once again. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were thinking it was going to be in Jacksonville this time and that they had the shot to go to the uh, uh, to the Super Bowl. So to say that it's you know they're going to just completely move on from that is difficult, but I think you have to point to maybe what was the issue in Jacksonville, and I think a lot of people are pointing to Bortles. So if they do decide to cut him loose, they just, you know, obviously this huge contract there, cap it, are always, always a question. So they're going to have to work out that brain trust and see what uh, what's what and what they're going to be able to do. But it's uh, that's a very difficult, you know, position to be in. Uh, but I don't, my gut reaction tells me I don't see how they're able to go in with Boyles as their starting quarterback this year, something's going to have to be done, and I think they're going to have to make a decision, maybe a decision they don't want to have to make, but I think it's coming. Which leads me, speaking of quarterbacks, to a quarterback that really made a name for himself this year and is going to continue to do so, and that name is Mitch Trubisky. We both have been high on him, you know, basically since the game at Soldier Field where – the Bears came up one yard short from tying the New England Patriots. You know, Trubisky brought his team back. You know, Trubisky just may be that franchise quarterback that the Bears have been searching for. I think he is. I mean, and, and seeing what I saw from Trubisky last year and seeing what he was able to do and how he was able to do it, the poise that he showed, leading the Bears team that a lot of people didn't believe were going to be a, a real force in right. the league last year. 
Uh, you know, they were picked to finish middle of the pack, even even after the addition of Khalil Mack. A lot of people were still questioning whether or not Trubisky was going to be able to lead the offense, whether or not the Bears were going to be able to get it together. A lot of people thought this was going to be kind of a, a transition year for them. Uh, they were very formidable, and I think that Trubisky has shown enough in his repertoire to show that he's going to be someone that they can rely on down the stretch. I think they have found their franchise quarterback, and I think you put pieces in and of itself a little bit around him, beef up the offense a little bit, because that defense is definitely stout enough to be able to carry them toward uh, a deep playoff run. Uh, I like what I see out of Chicago this year, and if you're a Bears fan, I think you should too. This is a good opportunity for them. It's a wonderful opportunity for them. You figure one more receiver to give to Trubisky, and they will. that offense will really be humming because a couple of games this year they put 40-plus points on the board, and Trubisky leading that offense is, is something special. The game with the Bears, for me, that really put them on the map besides the shootout with New England was the Thanksgiving Day game in Detroit when they were minus Trubisky, and the defense found a way to win that ball game. Absolutely. And you know what? And the good teams, the teams that are battle tested or the teams that really need to pass the battle test, I guess is a better way for me to put it. Always find a way to pull those games out when you don't think they're going to be able to do it when they're down players, when they have, you know, they're depleted and it looks like all the odds are stacked against them. They find a way to pull that out and they use their strengths to do it. Um, in New England, uh, we, I've seen that team do that constantly since Bill Belichick has been here. He'll Absolutely. take his best strength, and he will definitely be able to utilize it to keep his team competitive, even when it looks like they shouldn't be competitive. I saw that in Chicago a lot last year. Uh, that's one of the definitely one of the uh, uh, the flagship uh, uh, examples of that. But I've seen that in Chicago last year uh, on a number of different occasions where Trubisky looked like he was struggling, and the defense was able to, to you know, to bring that up. Even the New England game where, they, where the defense was breaking a little bit and they were giving up points, Trubisky and the Bears were able to get points on the board and keep that one to a razor-thin margin. So they're, this is a team that really has the ability, I think, to rise above that and really take a giant step forward this year uh, between the job that Nagy has done as, uh, as head coach and uh, Trubisky leading that team and really kind of taking them on his shoulders. Uh, good things coming out of Chicago. That's a team on, in the NFC side. I know in the AFC we talk a lot about the Indianapolis Colts and yes. their emergence, and, and we definitely, definitely uh, you know, are in agreement that that team is taking a giant step forward this year. Yeah, they have. But look for big things out of the Bears as well. I really like what I see, and I – I think that's their division this year to lose, even with a possible resurgence in Green Bay. I still think the Bears are better top to bottom. That that division is the Bears to lose, and it's going to be that way for a couple of years. Staying in the NFC, is it possible that we could see Mitch Trubisky and Jimmy Garoppolo hooking up in a playoff game this year? Oh, I think it's definitely a possibility. I mean, we're going to have to see how the seeds fall. There's no question about it. But right. if you're asking whether or not these two teams are going to be capable of making the playoffs, I would say absolutely, without question on both ends. I think that San Francisco was a playoff team last year. We've gone through their the, de- the decimation of injury and yeah. just trying to find their identity. I think losing... When you lose your quarterback like that, it is so, so difficult, especially for a young team and a young head coach like like Kyle Shanahan, to be able to recreate that type of feeling that you had going in to training camp. Um, Yes, we saw, and I know I come back to New England, but it it really is likened to when the Patriots lost Brady on the first play of the season in 2008. Mm -hmm. They had Bill Belichick in place. Bill Belichick knows how to weather those types of storms and was able to get tremendous quarterback play out of Matt Castle. And they were able to, to trudge forward. What people forget is that they also took a gigantic step back. They didn't make the playoffs that year. Right. Castle played pretty well, but they weren't able to quite recreate it. But he was able to keep them in a playoff hunt, and the Patriots won more than they lost, which is remarkable. Teams that lose a quarterback like that in their, in their early part of the season, it usually it has a terrible, terrible effect on the team's psyche. That's what you saw out of San Francisco last year. I don't think you'll see that this year. Jimmy G comes in, even though he might still 
be on the men from a from an injury like that, you know, even if it's just getting his timing back, things of that nature, just having him in that lineup is such a presence for the San Francisco 49ers that you'll see that identity come back pretty quickly. As for Chicago, like I said, they're on their way. They had one or two little pieces. All of a sudden, they're in strong contention to be the NFC representative, I think, in Miami, Super Bowl 54. Yeah. So, And I don't think that's that far off. I really and truly don't. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, what the Bears are able to do. But uh, that's a team in the NFC right now that I'm really very high on. Oh, they're, The two, Chicago and San Francisco, I'm very, very high on. Given their given their quarterback play, including the play of Nick Mullins, who stepped in for Jimmy Garoppolo when C.J. Beathard didn't work out, if I were the 49ers, I'd keep Mullins. You don't want to lose that valuable backup. Oh, absolutely. I I've heard a lot of people say that oh they'll move on from Mullins, oh they'll trade Mullins, or you know things of that nature. Um, up here in New England, you constantly hear uh, you know rumors of, oh, well, Belichick will trade for him. Well, that's not going to happen. But basically <laughs> what's going to happen there is the San Francisco 49ers know that Jimmy Garoppolo is coming back from and from a very you know difficult injury to come back from. There's no guarantee that a player is going to be able to stay on the field. Why trade a guy away that you are not really tying up a tremendous amount in cap room You do have him controlled. It's a situation where it's almost dumb to trade him away. You saw the Philadelphia Eagles hang on to a guy that won the Super Bowl for them. We're very content to put him on the bench in favor of Carson Wentz. And I think that when you see things like that, it's really, it's always, always so important to be able to carry a quarterback that can back you up, that can do what you need to do to keep your team afloat. When Tom Brady was suspended for a couple of for uh, the first four games mm-hmm. of the 2015 season, Jimmy Garoppolo was waiting in the wings, which is why Patriots fans were not shaking in their boots, saying, "Oh my God, for four games we're going right. to be absolutely right. killed. We're going to go 0 and 4." Most people were talking, "Well, we're probably going to go 2 and 2. We're probably going to go 1 and 3, or we're going to, you know, or, or, or 3 and 1." I should say, nobody was worried that they were going to go 0 and 4 through that stretch because no. they had a quarterback the caliber of Jimmy Garoppolo on the bench. San Francisco's smart. They'll have Nick Mullins in the fold. In the event Jimmy has any type of a setback, you know Nick can run this offense, and you know that he can do a fairly serviceable job. So it's at least something they can prepare for this year. But um, they, they get a good quarterback situation in, uh, in San Francisco. They really do. They really do. One more team we'll look at. It's a team we look at often, and I will put it in the form of this question. How far can the Indianapolis Colts go in 2019? Well, I think the ceiling right now for them is pretty what teams do. It depends on how well teams are stocked. New England is always going to be the roadblock in the AFC for any. Everybody's always going to look at them and say, well, you have to count the Patriots as a favorite to at least be in the AFC championship game. Absolutely. So, you know, copiness or hubris or anything like that coming from me. It's simply a a fact when you take a look at what they've been able to do for the last 18 years uh, throughout the NFL. In terms of being able to reach the AFC championship game, though, I think the Colts have as good a shot as anybody to be able to be there, not only to be there, but to win it. Um, This is a team that came very close uh, to making the AFC championship game after starting off 1-5. and That's amazing. That's an amazing feat. When you take a look, if you talk about battle-tested, that team could have folded and could have said, that's it, we're done. Uh, Andrew Luck is past his prime. He's never going to be able to recreate what what he once had because of the injuries. We're done. We're folding up, and we're going to just look for the future, and we're going to look for draft picks. That team knew the talent they had. They knew the capabilities that they had, and Frank Wright cannot get enough you know credit for that. I know you know he's you know won the awards and the accolades, and they're so well deserved. But to me, it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the job he did there in uh, in Indy this year. There's a lot of talent on both sides of the ball. I think what they would need to do is their defense showed a lot of promise. If they can get somebody up front that can be able to to stop the run a little bit, keep their team in check, and be able to allow their linebackers and their secondary to get back in coverage every time the quarterback drops back, this is going to be an extremely, extremely tough team to beat. On offense, they're almost there. Marlon Mack emerged as a real 
running threat. And I think you see him along with maybe some uh, additional wide receiver help. Um, if they can bring back Eric Ebron, I think he was a very good fit for them at tight end. Yes. This is a team that I think really has a chance to be one of the top two or three teams in the AFC and maybe one of the top five teams in the league total um, in terms of where their capabilities are this year. So do they have a chance to get to the AFC championship game? Most definitely. They have a shot to win it too, folks. So if they can make the right moves and st- and keep their foot on the accelerator, which by all accounts it looks like Frank Reich and Ballard and the Brain Trust in Indy are definitely looking to do, um, this could be a big year for Indianapolis. It really, really could. Mike DeBate joining me here at the second half of the show to talk all things NFL offseason. Was your team selected for our discussion? You never know. Follow us online at SIT Morning and follow him at FPC underscore Patriots and FPC underscore NFL. Man, this is just getting started. I'm having a lot of fun, and I hope you are too. Thank you, brother. Appreciate the time. Always a pleasure, Brian. Look forward to it. I'll talk to you next week, my friend. Have talk, a good one. Talk to you next week. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Well, that's about all I got for you this morning, folks. We talked some basketball. We talked some football. I had two great guests on. Thank you to Cole Johnson of Cole Sports. And also thank you to Mike DeBate of Full Press Coverage. Have a great day. God bless. Remember to make your next move your best move. And always remember, if your dreams don't scare you, then they are not big enough. Dream big, do bigger. I'm out of here. See you tomorrow.